I think I have a little explaining to do. We spent $20,000 and printed 30,000 of these magazines and passed them out all over Long Island. We drove everyone crazy for the last six months promoting this conference. And thank God people have come in a big way. <clears throat> and a lot of people say, I'm not sure what the purpose of this whole conference is, is it doesn't seem very profitable, you're not charging anything. What exactly is going on? And then on the other end, I asked these speakers to come. They're very busy, they have other commitments, and I asked them to please take time from their life with no benefit to them other than to be here to speak to you. And not only that, there's eight of them when one of them could easily explain this easily. So what is the reason that I have made such a big deal, summoned all of Long Island, summoned everyone nationally, and asked eight of the top experts in the world to come and fly here and spend their time. And the reason is quite simple. This is what's going on. I would say that the health and environmental situation is as serious as it could possibly be. The statistics are startling. They're beyond startling. The environmental statistics are terrifying. This is not a time to say, Let's just go meatless on Mondays, turn the thermostat to 68, and everything will be fine. We are in a situation that couldn't be more urgent. The only reason that everyone doesn't know that is because not everyone's reading all the statistics. If you're reading the obesity statistics and the diabetes statistics and all the other related health statistics, you would understand that things have never been this advanced. The problem's never so severe. The economic implications on our country uh, are, are, are tremendous. So I have asked these people who have spent so much time researching it, who are unbiased, who have no affiliation except to tell you the truth, to come here and once and for all, let's get the clear crystal truth and let's spread it as fast as possible because the situation is critical. Um, and I guess I would just say, you know, one more time that if, in 19, if everyone could go back in a time machine to 1910 and say to everyone, don't smoke, it's going to be really bad, a lot of people, a lot of families would have been spared. So maybe the point of this is to get people's attention so they don't have to suffer the consequences, but instead could find out today where we stand. So I'd love to open by saying this is going to be on YouTube. Not every single person will watch every second of our video, and this might be the only time that some people who watch this in the future actually see you. They might not read your book, they might not watch your video, and there might not be another opportunity for you to communicate to people all over the world except right now. So if each of you would take three minutes and tell people what's on the top of your mind, you've been writing books, you've been lecturing, you've been doing research for years, what is it that you want people, we're all here your fans, but around the world on video, there's going to be a lot of people that are seeing you for the first time. Before we get into specific questions, if each of you would take three minutes and tell everyone what it is that you think they need to know in case you don't have another chance to speak to them. Just push the button and keep I'll, about six inches I'll, from I'll the mic. Off. I'll uh, start off. And my guess is what I will say will be pretty similar to what other people might say too, but I completely agree that this is a time that is unprecedented in terms of the seriousness of what we as a, as a planet face uh, and in terms of climate change. Uh, 30 years ago, we recognized that this was a change, but we thought it would be something that would be happening over a course of centuries. but. We've seen a huge acceleration, and it's happening right before our eyes, and the consequences are happening right before our eyes, too. And it's this nonlinear phenomena that is really frightening that uh, I'll tomorrow uh, give a few uh, bits of data, but uh, the news this past year has been full of information. Just something like the Greenland ice cap has melted t seven times faster in the last decade than it did just two or three decades ago. It's, so it's really this enormous upswing in ice melting, temperatures climbing in a very nonlinear way. Uh, we're way off track to stay under the 
uh, two degrees centigrade uh, limit that the, double, the United Nations uh, IPCC has set as a goal for 2100. Uh, we're headed toward, at this present, double or more uh, uh, increase in temperature unless we make some major, major changes. Uh, and again, that's not far off. Uh, that this is the world that our grandchildren are going to inherit. It's not hypothetical, it's real, and it's, it's, it's in, our, in our family. So I've studied and worked on health for all of my career, but now I'm feeling that, in fact, this is a more important issue because if we can't address that issue, everything we do with health and everything we uh, do in terms of better diets uh, will, will fall apart and, and be irrelevant. We have to deal with that situation uh, the, the climate change issue in a very urgent way. Um, at the same time, the obesity epidemic is undermining health in a way that uh, it ha has never before. Uh, and again, uh, it's the steady increase. It's not just that we have a, a, a very difficult problematic situation at the moment, but uh, the projections are that by uh, 2030, uh, which is not very far away at all, about half of Americans will be obese. And it's, there's been, uh, we thought a few years ago there might be a little slowdown, but no, it, the numbers keep going up. And now we're seeing that uh, in, in terms of its consequences, that in uh, people, adults under 50, cancers like colon cancer that had been going down for 50 or 60 years have turned around, they're going back up again. Uh, diabetes is still going up very steadily. Uh, heart disease rates, which had been coming down, we had reduced mortality from heart disease about 80% among younger adults. That's on its way back up again. Uh, it's really the, the fundamental problem is that that generation that became obese as children uh, uh, has now moved into adulthood when the consequences that we knew would happen are actually happening right before our eyes. So these are really uh, very serious phenomena. We're on track for things to get much worse unless we make big changes. But I will end with good news. There is a possible way out that is a double wind that we can be healthier, we can have a healthy planet, and uh, it's, uh, the healthy diets are a very important part of that solution. They're not the only thing. I ride my bicycle, but we just got an electric car last week for the first time. We, we have to get uh, fossil fuels out of our, uh, out of our con uh, uh, society as fast as we can. So anyway, that's my three minutes. Uh, yeah, thank you. Push the button. Push that little button. That's right. Try again. Thank you. <laughs> Dr. Willard, what I really would like to hear your thoughts on, because uh, I can remember when you were at the Vatican conference, was it? About three years ago. Three, was it three years ago? You made a profound statement about 30% of the world was plant-based. Would you, can you remember that? Would you repeat, repeat that? That was absolutely, uh, I think, <clears throat> the capstone of what you were saying. Well, I should remember it. I don't make too many trips to the Vatican, I must say. But, uh, uh, that, uh, I think we were saying somewhere around 25, 30 percent of mortality could be prevented by a healthy diet if the world moved to a healthy diet. Yes. So I, I will say amen to everything Dr. Willett just said, and actually that goes for everything Dr. Willett will say, too. <laughs> the, the one thing that I would append to Walter's comments is he is the lead author of the Eat Lancet Commission Report on Diet, People, and the Planet, and if you're not familiar with that, please get familiar with that. It maps out the boundaries we have to honor if we want a sustainable diet. What I would add to those great comments is that diet is at the confluence of everything that matters most. Personally, to the public, all of its intimate effects, all of its ecosystem effects, and it reverberates through current events. Coronavirus traces its origins to the flaws in a global food system. 
incursions into fragile ecosystems, inequitable distributions of food, and a reliance on bushmeat in certain markets. That's probably what resulted in exposure, everybody seems to think, to bats where this virus originated, not a ghost, but essentially failure to honor the value of a plant predominant food supply worldwide, maldistribution, inequities, failure to develop a, a fair and sustainable agricultural system is probably the reason for this current global public health emergency. It's certainly one of the key reasons. Diet, is, as Walter Willett indicated, is a crucial component of everything going on with the climate. Diet is the reason that we're burning down the Amazon so we can graze cattle to satisfy the global demand for beef. Diet is the reason that we're burning down the rainforests in Borneo so we can replace them with palm oil plantations. So on the one case, it's an appetite for beef. On the other, it's an appetite for processed food and palm oil. And then, of course, diet is the single leading cause of premature death in our culture. There was an op-ed in the New York Times on August 26th of 2019 entitled, Our Food is Killing Too Many of Us. It was by Darish Mozafarian, Dean of Nutrition at Tufts, and Dan Glickman, former Secretary of Agriculture of the United States. They cite the evidence in that op-ed in the New York Times that diet is the single leading predictor variable of all-cause mortality and all major chronic disease. So it's the explanation for ravaging the planet. It is a clear and present danger for us and our families in terms of our health. And its effects reverberate from coronary artery disease to coronavirus. So I think on behalf of all of us, I thank all of you for having enough interest in the topic to be here on a Friday night. If I can jump in. the button. If I can jump in here. Um, I, I, I agree with what you just said, uh, Dr. Katz. Um, you know, the whole question concerning environment, um, cost of health care, uh, all being related to um, what we choose to eat. I like your word confluence, I think you just said. Um, I just had an uh, opportunity. I've been in this business, as uh, some of you know, as I said today, for 65 years since my graduate studies. <laughs> That's counting my graduate studies. <laughs> yeah, you and I are in the same boat. <laughs> he, S is my senior by three months. <laughs> In any case, I, I, uh, some years ago, I, I represent the field of nutrition, as I explained, and I have to tell you, being in the field of nutrition is tough. <laughs> uh, th that concept of nutrition, which I call, I <clears throat> define as the expression of food, you know, sort of biochemically, metabolic, and so forth, uh, that concept of nutrition uh, I find very troubling in the sense that it's so confusing for so many people. Yet at the same time, the power of nutrition to actually express itself in a way of creating health is really, really impressive. At least that's what I've seen emerge over those years. And um, along the way, uh, as I said, uh, the whole idea of, of uh, confusion struck me some years ago. You now about 20, 40, 50 years ago, I guess. But uh, it's, it's troubled me. You know, why, why is it so difficult for the public to get to know it's not just the public? as we in the professions as well. Why is it so difficult to really get a handle on what nutrition really means? I mean, all we need to look at is all the claims that are going on here and there in stores and everything else in the media to realize it's a troubling uh, concept. And I would argue that until we can somehow convey what this means to the public, so everybody gets to know it better and in a simple way so they can actually use it in an effective way, um, that's what we need to do is to sort of reach into some of these problems. I recently had an opportunity to think about uh, writing a book again, which I've done. Uh, and the, the, this goes to that question concerning why are we so confused. I find that to be a fascinating subject. And so I, in the book, I've had the opportunity going back and look at the history back to the 1700s, looking for the roots of why we think what we think. Look for the roots of why we are so troubled with this concept. 
because nutrition as a science, as I don't believe my medical colleagues here will disagree with me, uh, nutrition is not really effectively taught in medical schools. I think that's, that's point number one. And uh, I've often wondered why there, there, there's an, a discord between nutrition and, let's say, clinical practice. Quite a discord. The medical system doesn't, I think, appreciate it very much, partly because uh, the professionals are not being taught the subject. But in history, and I'll leave it just as this, in history, I think I found something very exciting. And that is the way we sort of started thinking about how food works through nutrition. Uh, way back in the 1800s and on through the, that period. And there were two prominent ideas at that time. One was that it was a, that the whole idea of food being related to disease was said to be a constitutional effect. Constitutional effect. Really an interesting word. Whole bodies involved, all that sort of thing. Uh, the alternative was uh, the idea that disease is locally formed, locally treated, locally caused. So the two concepts, the local theory of disease and the constitutional nature of disease, once you get into exploring that particular concept, then you can see the roots of why we got to where we got now. Uh, because we tend to think of such small little particles or small little ideas mm. about the whole, the whole subject. Thank you. <laughs> so so we, we tend to think instead of, think of the whole, we're always going for little bits and pieces to carve out some particular information for ourselves or maybe for us some other purposes. And I just find this concept of nutrition now, I'm really sold on the idea. It is a holistic, and I like the word W in front of that word. It's a holistic effect, where it's infinitely complex, mecha mechanistically, of course. But in reality, once you realize how to, to look at this system sense, in a system sense, that we can get fairly simple ideas out of it. And that's where I get very excited about the whole food plant-based diet. But because it is, after all, at the end of the day, it is our eating plants, not using, not, not, not using livestock, for example, which is at the root of the environmental issues we all know. Um, and uh, cost of health care, it just it starts expanding like this, all starting with the idea of just really understanding what does that concept really mean. It's something more than this nutrient, that nutrient, this disease, that mechanism. It's the whole thing, working together in a very systematic way. Uh, I'll follow up on... Uh, press the red buttons when you're uh, done, so that you're not... What's that? On, yeah, and press it so it's not red. Thank you. Go ahead. I'll follow up on, on uh, Dr. Campbell's comments, which I agree with everything that's been said here. Um, the confusion about nutrition and um, the message that people get about nutrition. I'm probably, I think I am the only person here who came from a business background before I was involved in healthcare. And there's some value in that because you look at things through a different lens, like how, how much traction are you gain, gaining in the marketplace? How, how are you convincing people? How many con, are people are you convincing? And I think that we have a marketing problem we need to solve and a messaging problem that we need to work on. And um, I said last night that I think part of this is making sure that we focus on the things we have in common instead of the things that we differ on. And I think the other thing is figuring out how to take a cohesive message that is attractive to the public, making them want to ju jump on board. Now, we have the best story in the world. This is the best story in medicine, what we have right here, that you can, without any expense at all, in fact, your grocery bill will go down if you do this, you can go to the grocery store and make meals like you've always been doing. Nothing really changes much except the content of the food. And you can prevent and reverse diseases like heart disease and diabetes and some cancers and that sort of thing. If you could put this in a pill, I gave a lecture in Denmark last year that if I could put this information in, a, in, a, in the form of a pill, I'd have the biggest, richest drug company in the world. You would all want to invest in it, and so would everybody else. But the problem is the messaging, because people aren't getting the message. So I think what we have to do is, is really work on how we're conveying what we're conveying to the public in a way that makes them want to come in and join us. And I think that that involves targeting different populations of people with different messages. This is what you do when you're in business. 
um, testing, messaging, working together actually for the purpose of not only furthering research, but furthering how we message this to the public so that we gain traction faster. Dr. Furman said last night that his estimate of the number of people who are actually eating an optimal diet is about 2.5% of the population. Not just a plant-based diet, but people who are really doing it right. I'll give you another statistic that might blow your mind even more, and that is that right now the data show that 85% of people who've adopted a plant-based diet did it for ethical reasons, not health reasons, which tells us the message isn't getting through. So when you have the best product in the world, think of it if it was a drug that we were trying to market, and you're not selling it to the public. Our problem is not that the research isn't right, and the problem isn't that what we're doing doesn't work, and the problem isn't that the results speak for themselves or the science is on our side. Our problem is messaging, and I think that we should be having conferences among ourselves to not debate the science, but to figure out how to sell this to the public, and I think that's maybe the most important thing we have to deal with. So my, my message to patients is that as important as these larger external environmental issues are, that they can perhaps have the biggest effect on the external environment by beginning to focus on their internal environment. And the way that you resolve your internal environmental imbalances is through diet, sleep, and exercise. And that the type of diet that's going to be most effective at producing a health-promoting internal environment is a whole plant food diet that also eliminates the addition of salt, oil, and sugar. That's it. Well, I guess I'm finishing up, and I think I'm gonna finish up by telling you a little story. So this story happened about 40 years ago when I was in university, and I was visiting my parents, and my dad, uh, he loved to tease me about my interest in nutrition. And I remember him uh, walking by, I was sitting, I was actually standing in the kitchen making lunch, and he walked by me and he stuck his belly out as far as he could, and he had two cigarettes hanging out of his mouth, and a bag of chips in one arm, bag of licorice all sorts under his armpit, and a two liter bottle of Coke in the other hand. And he looked at me and he just had this big cheeky grin on his face. And, uh, I just, of course, gave him the look of disgust. And, and a couple of hours later, I, I went and talked to him, and I said, I don't, I don't understand why you're doing this. Um, you know, we, we want you to stick around. <laughs> we want you to, to be here for the long haul. And uh, he said to me, he said, you know, he said, I, I'd sooner live 50 years doing all the things I love to do uh, than live 75 having to uh, give up my freedom to do what I love. And he said, you know, I could get hit by a truck tomorrow. And I looked at him and I said, I know, Dad, but it doesn't mean you have to walk out in front of one. And the reality is that probably about 80% or more of the chronic diseases that are killing most of us are entirely preventable. It is our choice. And I think the thing that prevents people from making the right choice is, is that a, a huge need to belong to their tribe. And as we see mainstream shift, it will get easier and easier for people. And we, knew, we need to do everything we can to make it easier. And, and the reality is when we make a choice uh, for our health, there are consequences beyond ourselves. And the consequences were very eloquently laid out by the other speakers. The consequences are, we preserve this planet for future generations. And we remove, to a large extent, the suffering of the 70 billion animals that are slaughtered on this planet every year for our food. To, to me, it makes no sense that we, can, we, that we cause pain, suffering, and death to other living beings when it is not only unnecessary. We are destroying our planet in the process. We have a choice, 
and we need to make the right one for ourselves and for every other being that is on this planet. I'm going to ask the question you're all thinking to ask. Brenda, what happened to your dad? <laughs> uh, well, it, it is quite a story. And, and you know, my dad didn't make the kind of changes I wish he would have made. Um, but he was told, he, he actually, about uh, two, three years after this interaction, he had a stroke and was taken to the hospital. His blood pressure was 220 over 120. His blood sugar was over 500 milligrams per deciliter. And uh, he had to have grafts put below his heart into his legs. And he was told if he didn't stop smoking, he'd live three months. And if he did, he might live three years. And I can still remember sitting on his hospital bed and uh, right after the doctor told him and the tears were coming down and he looked at me and he said, I don't want to die. I, I, I want to dance with the love of my life at our 50th wedding anniversary. I want to see my grandchildren grow up. And it was at that point that my dad, I think, understood that without health, there is no freedom at all. And, and so my dad quit smoking and he started eating oatmeal and blueberries and flax seeds instead of bacon and eggs for breakfast. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm very happy to say that, that he stuck around for probably 26 more years, way longer than anyone ever um, thought he would. And for that, I am grateful. Uh, he died in 2011 and I miss him every day. Thank you. Thanks for asking. I've uh, been <clears throat> listening to the others, and I thought that the way I'd like to make a few comments about why it is that a general surgeon gets interested in nutrition. And <clears throat> in the late 1970s and early 80s, when I was chairman of our breast cancer task force, I got quite disillusioned with the fact that for no matter how many women I was doing breast surgery, I was doing absolutely nothing for the next unsuspecting victim. <clears throat> and that led me to a bit of a global research. And it was really quite striking to find that there were other cultures where indeed breast cancer rates were 30 and 40 times less frequent than the United States. And if you looked at the women in rural Japan and post-World War II, uh, breast cancer was very infrequently identified, and yet as soon as the Japanese women would migrate to the United States by the second and third generation, still pure Japanese American, they now had the same rate of breast cancer as their Caucasian counterpart. Perhaps even more compelling was uh, looking at Japan. In 1958, in the entire nation of Japan, how many autopsy proven deaths were there from cancer of the prostate? Well, 18. That was the most mind-boggling public health figure I think I've ever encountered. By 1978, they were up to 137, which still pales in comparison to the 28,000 who will die this year in this country from prostate cancer. But it was long in this global research, I be <laughs> began to notice that I was encountering multiple cultures where cardiovascular disease was almost virtually non-existent. And it suddenly dawned on me that, you know, that's the leading killer of women and men in Western civilization. And really, it would be probably much more bang for the buck if we could do research on cardiovascular disease and show indeed that we could not only halt it, but reverse it. But the dream was that if people could be taught to eat to save their heart, they would at the same time be likely diminishing the likelihood of having the common Western cancers of breast, prostate, colon, and pancreatic. But here's where the rubber hits the road. <clears throat> Everybody's talked about this message. You cannot send out a message that is based on hype and snake oil. You've got to do the science, because then I think everybody, the science, the skeptics, everybody, if your science, science is solid, that's what will happen. So uh, that was led with my first study and the second study. And I think uh, if 
feel that the way you've heard me conclude time and again about cardiovascular disease is that coronary artery disease is nothing more than a toothless paper tiger that need never ever exist. And if it does exist, it need never ever progress. This is a b completely benign foodborne uh, illness. So I guess my plea to the, uh, to the moderators uh, wish that we could all sort of see what we have for the vision. My vision is that we can actually solidify the, the science and really get that message of science in a format <coughs> that the public can get their arms around so we can really then move forward. Thank you. So there's actually really one question that everyone wants me to ask more than anything by far. And the question is, of all your years of research, all the studies, every single piece of data you've ever looked at, do you know how we could avoid cancer, diabetes, heart disease, chronic kidney disease, multiple sclerosis, and all these other horrible diseases that we just want to know. We really don't want to do research. We're not that interested in health and nutrition. We just want to stay healthy. From all that, and we argue with each other because we all have opinions, but from what the hardcore, unbiased, best research says, do you know how we could avoid these diseases? Anyone who would like to answer? I, I think I probably can echo what everyone here will say, basically, mostly, I believe. Uh, and that's the wholeness of food. I like that concept. The whole food. That doesn't mean to say that we just eat raw, whole food salads all, the, all day long. But it's the wholeness of food. When we actually chew the food, the whole thing together, whether it's cooked or not, or diced and sliced, that's one thing I think is a simple message, just offering that idea to people to get as close as they can to that concept of eating that kind of food. Go the whole way, that's, I suspect, the best of all. They become accustomed to it and they stay there. The second thing that I would say, and I have just two, two fairly simple, straightforward things. The second is try to avoid foods with animal protein in it, basically animal-based foods. That's a hard thing for me to say. It was from early days because I was raised on a farm milking cows. And I started out my career actually advocating for greater consumption of animal protein products. But through the years, uh, I finally arrived at this point. Once we sort of decide that, we're, that we have to eat animal foods to get that special protein, we distort the whole rest of the diet. And so we see these rather remarkable correlations, I don't know, correlations, uh, well, um, you know, we have to worry about causation not being, correlation not being equal to causation. But actually, when you see this, and they're consistent, they're usually called by other names, other kinds of foods, the, the correlation is so perfect when we look at across countries to see the relationship between the consumption of animal protein or surrogates, such as cholesterol consumption, saturated fat, and so forth. When you see that, it's really consistent to see that when societies start gravitating toward more and more consumption of animal-based foods, there's a problem. So two things, eat the food in a whole food form, not take the individual nutrients out and try to do stuff with it. And secondly, just try to eat plants. It's fairly simple. I think if we could just sort of convey that simple message, we'll be able to capture probably, I would suggest 80 to 90% of the achievable and 80 to 90 percent of the achievable gains that we can make without getting caught up in all the details. Steve, I'm, I'm going to redirect the answer a little bit, if I may. So you, you asked us how we can prevent all these scourges, how we can avoid them. Brenda told the story of her father, and these personal and intimate stories are always poignant. So I have one too. Ather Ali was a dear friend of mine, naturopathic physician, first my resident, then my protege, then my colleague, the first naturopathic physician ever on the faculty at Yale. One of the most beautiful people I've ever known. 
plant-based diet, no exposure to toxins, loving wife, beautiful children, tranquil, peaceful, meditated daily, slept enough, and died tragically at 42 of esophageal cancer. And I still have a hard time saying it. I still hear his soft voice in my mind anytime I talk about him. So I, I think one critical consideration for all of us is humility. We are vulnerable creatures. We control ship and sail, but never wind and wave. So nothing you hear from any of us can ever offer a guarantee. All we can hope to do is shift the odds in our favor. But I agree emphatically with Dr. Campbell about how massively we can shift the odds. So to pivot again and reinforce the message, I completed my training in internal medicine in 1991, went to Yale to do my training in preventive medicine for the next two years. And in 1993, the year I completed that training, a paper was published in JAMA, which had a major influence on the trajectory of my career. This was by Bill Fagey and Mike McGinnis, entitled Actual Causes of Death in the United States. And it was an evidence-based answer to your question, Steve. So what these two epidemiologists did was enumerate the factors, the root causes, explaining the leading causes of death every year in our country. So they went beyond what winds up on a death certificate to say, okay, the death certificate says stroke or heart disease or cancer, but we want to know what caused that. And by the time they were done, almost all of the premature deaths that happen in this country every year, but for a rounding error, were explained away. And the full list of factors was 10 things, and that list included environmental exposures to toxins, socioeconomic disparities, poverty is a leading cause of death, right? So some of what we need to do is not just about how we take care of our own bodies. Some of what we need to do requires action by the body politic, but what reverberated with me as a young man just starting my career in preventive medicine was that 80% of the net effect was concentrated in the first three things which I've described ever since as bad use of feet, forks, and fingers. Right? Physical activity levels were inadequate, dietary patterns were bad, and we were smoking excessively. Again, diet's now number one, but if you go beyond that list, you can append a few more. I like feet, forks, fingers, sleep, stress, and love. That's a bit more holistic, Colin, to, to tap into the theme. And so we can shift our personal risk and we can shift the risk at the population level massively away from all of these chronic diseases and premature death from any cause. That's got to be good enough because we don't get a guarantee no matter what we do. I'll just add to that a little bit, and I completely agree with uh, Dr. Katz that we do need a good dose of humility, and we're not going to prevent all of those things on the list and become immortal. Uh, and talk about planetary health, that would be pretty bad if we did. So we, we have to realize that it's appropriate that we have a finite period on this planet. But we, in addition to just making it as long as possible, we want to have it be the best quality as possible. And it's, I agree with what others have said about the uh, general direction of diet that, we've, that has been described is uh, clearly well established, well uh, ba based on strong evidence. Uh, uh, and I think uh, we, as Pamela says, we need to uh, focus on the big picture where there's strong agreement. There's always going to be uh, some disagreements about some of the details. Maybe not always, but at least for, for quite a while, I'm sure there will be. Uh, and that's where we tend to focus our discussion, but we shouldn't lose sight of the commonality. Uh, it, it naturally, is there's no interest in talking with each other about the things where we agree because we don't learn anything. <laughs> it's, it's, not, it's boring. Um, it's where we disagree. It's more interesting, and it stimulates science and advancement. And, and there are lots of details we don't know. Not all vegetables. Uh, maybe it's very possible that not all vegetables are healthy, even whole vegetables, uh, I, because those number one have been bred to be, they're all not, none of them are natural, the things we eat except uh, wild blueberries and a few other things. They've all been uh, distorted to be uh, most attractive to our taste. 
and yield and things like that. So it's not automatic that everything is healthy. Um, and I, the other thing is that there, uh, David is quite right that uh, we, we can't forget smoking, physical activity, and a lot of those do converge to, uh, in, in terms of overweight being a very big risk factor. And then there's some things on your list like multiple sclerosis. We are learning now that f there's almost surely a, an a, a viral component to that, but now very strong evidence that inadequate vitamin D uh, is uh, part of the picture of multiple, the etiology of multiple sclerosis as well. So a diet isn't going to cure everything, but it, it does, as David said, put the odds strongly in our favor. Uh, we had a paper just published this past week looking at how much healthy life expectancy we could gain by adopting that simple set of healthy behaviors. We had earlier published that we could add 10 years to our life by uh, that simple set of uh, behaviors where the causality is well established, I think, through multiple kinds of studies, uh, in particular, not smoking, being physically active, uh, maintaining a healthy uh, body weight and adopting a healthy diet. Uh, what we uh, just published uh, this past uh, couple, in, in the past few days, was the, these added 10 years are all healthy 10 years. It's not that we're just headed toward more years in a nursing home or something like that with dementia. Uh, and so it does seem that, the, that there is a huge opportunity for putting the odds of having healthier years in our favor. But it, uh, any one of us, could have something really bad happen to us next week. We could be diagnosed with a lymphoma that we don't know how to prevent yet and things like that. So we, there's still a lot to learn. Uh, but with what we have in hand, uh, we, as Pam says, this is better than any medicine on the shelf. Yeah. A couple of things. I, I think it's great that we're talking about you know, Dr. Campbell, you're the father of holism in our movement, right? Whole food, whole, whole food diets. But there's a bigger whole, and you were talking about it last night, the importance of rest and water and exercise and that sort of thing. So talking about the whole lifestyle picture, because you can watch every morsel you put in your mouth, and if you spend your life sitting, you're going to have problems. That's, you probably aren't going to be living to an old age independently if you do that. So the first thing is I think this focus on holism with this panel is maybe a, taking things to another level. When it comes to um, risk, I don't think we can promise anybody anything, but people ask me all the time, so if I do this, you know, if I do everything you're talking about, you know, does this, is this a guarantee that I'm not going to get sick? It's not. But I teach through analogies, so I tell people, I want you to think about your health like driving a car. Okay, I drive a car, keep it in good working order, I have insurance, I fasten my seatbelt, I observe the speed limit laws almost all the time, and I, and I watch, I mean, I'm very careful, I don't drive when the conditions are terrible, and I don't drink and drive and do stupid things like that. Now, having said that, I could, on my way home from the airport on Sunday, get hit by a bus, the proverbial bus. There's nothing you can do about that. The problem is, if you get so worried about the bus, which is not likely to happen, you don't pay attention to the things that are most likely to happen, which is degenerative disease, and that's where the habits that we're talking about here become so important. So I don't think we have to give people a guarantee. I think we have to put the promise that we're making in perspective that way, and it's the best shot you have. It isn't perfect, but it's the best shot you have, and I don't think if anybody really understood the statistics like the group of us do, that they would opt to do anything else. Because from a statistical standpoint, it's your best shot of living to old age independently, not in the home. So I like mnemonics, so I always give my patients the deep mnemonic, diet, environment, activity, and psychology. Those are the areas that you can do something about. And like you said, if you can shift the odds to be dramatically in your favor, people say, well, you know, what if I what, I, what if I get old and get hit by a bus? My answer is, what if you get old and you don't get hit by a bus? <laughs> and just, just to comment at the confluence of what you said, Walter, and what you said, Pam, I, I think the value proposition, Steve, isn't just dialing down the risk of something bad happening at some point in the future. Yeah, you can do that. Shift the odds massively in your favor. But per this paper you just published, Walter, and when is there a week you haven't just published a paper? Let, let's be honest about it. I mean, it's really annoying. Uh, 
we're not just talking about adding years to life. We're talking about adding life to years. And if, if every day you live between now and that unknown future is filled with vital energy and you can seize the day, that's the prize. It doesn't get any better than that, right? Nobody knows about tomorrow, but if, if you can live today fully, that's the prize. Okay. Okay, so now my marketing business mind is working. And one of the things that I think has happened in our culture is that old age doesn't seem very attractive to most people. I've actually had people say, I don't want to live to be 90, oh my gosh, until they're 88 and sick and then they definitely want to live to be 90. I never had anybody in my office, no matter how old they are, that didn't want to live some more, right? But one of the things that I think we could do from a marketing standpoint is show people what healthy old age looks like. Look at Dr. Campbell, look at Dr. Esselstyn, right? What great role models. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Dr. Goldhammers just said, are you calling them old? Well, but <laughs> they're older than me, and, and I'm, I, I'm understanding how to love people who are older than me now that I'm this age, right? But, uh, but anyway, I think that would be such a great way to show people what you have to look forward to. I mean, if you look at people, no wonder people don't want to get old. They see family members ending up in memory care and nursing homes. I don't want to do that either. But if you show me a way that I could be productive and still living in my own home and working every day and doing what I want to do when I'm 97, I want to sign up for that. And most people, I think, actually do. I'm glad I have, I'm sitting next to someone who's interested in marketing because I, I quite agree that we've been a failure in, in that area. And I spend a lot of my time, a good bit of my time, working with the Culinary Institute of America for the last 15 years because uh, it, it's not going to be an easy sell to t um, telling people what they shouldn't eat. Uh, and it, it's much better to be able to show them, allow them to taste, enjoy uh, uh, food that is really good tasting and, and pleasant. And so uh, I think we want to be able to market something that is really aspirational, something people want. And we have a, really a triple win here. Uh, it's good for you, good for the planet, and, by, and it also tastes really wonderful. And that's why chefs and that whole world, uh, uh, is, uh, those are people we really do need to get on our side. Uh, we're not going to sell deprivation. That's a hard sell, uh, even though you could make a statistical case for it. Uh, uh, but I think we, we, we can sell this in a very positive way. But uh, I'd like to hear your thoughts on a little bit more, Pamela, on, on the best way to do that. I think one of the big, most important things you said is we're not going to sell deprivation. We have to sell how spectacular it is, how, what a great life you can have. And the fact the food is delicious. And, and that it's easy to do, and it's inexpensive to do. And this is sometimes an unpopular thought, but I always put it out there anyway, and it doesn't have to be perfect. Because when people think that, you know, I always tell people, I did not start a company called I Wanna Be Like Pam. I'm not perfect, by the way, but it's called Wellness Forum Health. And the reason for that is that, I, again, I think we have to, I said this last night, we have to have a bigger tent to invite more people in and meet them where they are and start them on a progress, uh, you know, progress toward a better goal and be a little bit more tolerant of people not making great big leaps. Some of them are ready to do it and they're fun to help. And some of them are not so ready to do it and they're also fun to help, but they have to be helped in a different way. So I think part of it is making sure that our message isn't so difficult for people to embrace. I'll tell you something interesting. I've done a lot of reading over the last few years over, about the science of change, because that's as important, really, as what it is that we're, the fact that we're asking people to change and what we're asking them to do. The two biggest reasons why people do something is, first of all, they think it will benefit them. My gosh, we've got that covered, don't we, really? But the second one, and it's just as important, they can see themselves doing it. And I think that's where we have to really work on our message. That's where we have to really work on meeting people where they are. Not only is this the best thing ever for your health, but we promise you can do it or your money back, okay? We promise you'll be able to do it. And those kinds of, I think that is an area we could work on too, is making people feel this is doable by anybody. Let us show you how.
Um, my friend, who's very smart, said red diet for New American, said I'm never having beef or chicken again. But he continues to eat fish and dairy. What, what, do, you, what do you need to say to him? In other words, he's only interested, like what's the, what's the problem if he eats, what's gonna happen in his life differently if he was eating beans and quinoa and beans and grains versus eating fish and cheese, fish and dairy. Well, what's the, what's gonna happen in his life differently health-wise because on a regular basis he eats fish and dairy as opposed to if he was eating a whole food plant-based diet. I think I have to say something about the dairy thing, uh, growing up milking cows, but uh, if that's what you're referring to. Uh, yeah, I found it uh, a little bit difficult to digest the information I was getting, no pun intended. Uh, but the question concerning uh, dairy, uh, especially because of its valued calcium and its valued protein, if you will, uh, the data really show very clearly that uh, that's problematic, pretty seriously problematic. Um, I, I don't know, I fall, fall back, I guess, on cliches of one sort or another. The dairy is just simply, the data are not there to support the consumption of dairy. And I'd really like to emphasize on that point the role of uh, feeding our children. Uh, one of the specific things I have in mind is the fact that the U.S. Dietary Guidelines, uh, in part, but uh, more to the point, uh, the school lunch program is such that for schools to participate in that, uh, they're required to at least offer the uh, dairy option. I've, I've found that troubling because that, in that case, is a marketing ploy as far as I'm concerned. Uh, it's not a health food, and it really uh, locks in children at a very young age to get started. So I don't know, I'm kind of dancing around your question, Steve, but uh, I, the, the data for me, uh, having been on both sides of the fence on that one, is very persuasive. The dairy is, I often say when people ask me, what should I drop first? I usually say dairy, uh, because I think uh, it is problematic in many different ways, starting out with the children especially. Did I, I don't know whether. Yep. That's great, uh, thank you. Yeah. 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 Um, I, Cal and I share a little bit of background. I could milk a cow by, was, by the time I was four years old, too, that I, we were dairy farmers for many generations in Michigan. Um, and we still have a family farm there, uh, owned by my cousin now. Uh, but uh, I think I would, uh, in responding to your question about your friend, uh, maybe I think uh, go the, down the path that Pam describes. and. Uh, not necessarily say that you need to give up dairy uh, completely forever. Uh, uh, there are, there's lots of evidence that uh, replacing dairy with some healthy plant-based protein sources like nuts and legumes and soy products will randomize trials showing it will improve your blood lipids. Uh, we have long-term epidemiologic studies showing that it will be related to lower risk of cardiovascular disease. Uh, and also, uh, your bones are not going to fall apart. Collins, right, you don't need to have large amounts of dairy. We do need some calcium, and for people who are really not getting it for other reasons, uh, getting from other sources, uh, a small amount of dairy could, could fill in some nutritional gaps. So I think a, an alternative, or one way to go is to say, you know, there's lots of evidence, and, if, and uh, we, you, I can help point you to some of that if you want it. But, um, uh, that uh, these changes, and it, I, whenever we talk about reducing something, it is really important to describe what we would do, uh, use to replace it, because if we replace it with Coca-Cola and uh, other high sugary sources, of course that's not going to be better, could even be worse than dairy. But uh, cutting down to one serving of dairy a day would probably be a huge step forward. And actually, fish has some positive nutritional value too. And I think it's, for most people, it's good to have fish once or twice a week. Uh, that uh, otherwise they may not be getting optimal amounts of omega-3 fatty acids. So it's not necessarily giving that up uh, either. Uh, if you, uh, if that person decides they want to become a strict vegan, well, that's also okay, but they're gonna have to pay some attention to sources of vitamin B12. But uh, again, we don't have to make one huge step altogether uh, going down a path. And that's that's what we see in our studies that the farther you go down that 
pa path toward a healthy whole food plant-based diet, the better it's getting every step uh, in that direction is better. But when you start to get down to really the difference between vegan and somebody who's having uh, the, uh, fish a couple times a week, in fact, what data we have say that the pescatarian actually looks a little bit better, but we really don't have data to make a sharp distinction between those, those two uh, kinds of diets. I love it when yeah, patients... Oh, I'm sorry. I, I, so I love it when patients come in and are using dairy products because I know that that's the single biggest factor that we can change that's likely to have short-term benefit in their life, whether it's their joint pain, their sinus congestion, their bowel disruptions, uh, their obesity. Uh, eliminating dairy, and particularly cheese and some of the other highly processed dairy food products, um, have the biggest short-term benefit to people in terms of what their direct experience is. So I, I'm glad to hear people that are suffering or including dairy because I know I have a quick fix uh, that will have a powerful impact on them. I, I was inclined to, to reaffirm Walter's perspective. Alan, you just mentioned highly processed dairy. So one of the things I was going to say is what dairy and what fish and, and what are the ancillary considerations and what's the dose? So the, the idea that you can't eat any of this if you want to live long and prosper is rather belied by the fact that four of five blue zones around the world, you're all familiar with the blue zones where people routinely live to be 100, don't get chronic disease, four of five are omnivorous. The only one that potentially is not is the Seventh-day Adventists in California. And a lot of them are vegetarians, so there's dairy there too. The vegans may do better than the vegetarians, but four or five are, are certainly omnivores. Uh, and dairy is a part of the diet in the two Mediterranean cultures that figure among the blue zones, the Sardinians and the Icarians. But that doesn't mean dairy is the reason they're living to be 100. Maybe they're living to be 100 despite the dairy. Or maybe it's because it's locally sourced, organic, grass-fed, no hormones, no antibiotics, all that good stuff. Maybe it's because the dose is very limited. So, you know, I, I think the critical point here is that if you massively shift the diet in the direction of plant predominance, whole foods, minimally processed, all that good stuff, there may not be as precise a definition of the one way to live long and prosper as our ideologies might make us favor. But then there are other considerations. How are we treating animals? How are we impacting the environment? I, I've heard colleagues say, for example, that fish is toxic. Eating fish is toxic. Well, it certainly is for the fish. <laughs> Most of the epidemiology would suggest it's beneficial to people, but compared to what? Keep in mind that when we talk about the health effects of isolated foods in the United States, usually the background for comparison is the stuff most people are eating. And the stuff most people are eating in the US is the seafood diet. I see food and I eat it, whatever the heck it is, even if it glows in the dark. Almost, almost any real food is better than that. So yeah, fish looks good, but would fish look good if you were introducing it against a backdrop of an optimal plant-exclusive diet where the only way to fit fish in your diet is to bump out some beans and to bump out legumes? Well, we don't know. That study could conceivably be done. I've not seen such a study done. Optimal plant-exclusive versus that plus a little fish and then maybe adjust the dose. So I, I think if, if we are going to stick with science, which is something that Essie asked us to do here and emphasize that, we have to be honest with you about the data gaps. Is the addition of some amount of sustainable fish good or bad against the backdrop of an already optimized plant predominant diet? I don't think we have data to answer that. Will some small amount of locally sourced dairy preclude you from living to be 100 free of chronic disease? Your friend? No, because they're doing that in Icaria, Greece. They're doing that in Sardinia, Italy. Maybe they're doing it despite the fact that they eat dairy. Maybe dairy is making some small beneficial contribution. But what's pretty clear is wherever people are living long and prospering with vitality, diet is mostly plant-based. 
And so dairy occupies a very small niche. And again, I think fish may be a, a, a somewhat more complicated to topic in terms of the health effects for us, but we're depleting the ocean. So again, my fallback position is eating fish may be good for people, may be bad for people. It's bad for the fish. I, I would I, be yeah, with, I, go ahead. Oh, I was, one thing I want to add to this, I would be with Dr. Goldhammer for getting rid of the dairy because I think it is the low hanging fruit to help people get better quickly. The mitigating factor with the blue zones that I think we have to take into consideration is there's a difference between somebody who grows up in Icarus, Greece, lives in a cloistered environment, eats an optimal diet from the very moment they enter the world, breastfed, good food, fresh food, and what can be in a diet when life starts that way versus the types of people who are ending up in our office who did not start life that way. That's what you see in your practice, Dr. Esselstyn. So, so I think that's a mitigating factor that has to be taken into consideration, that if you lived in Sardinia your whole life and your diet was perfect from the get-go but included some dairy and that sort of thing, you probably can get away with it. But that's not our patient base, right? Yeah, I think there's some uh, fascinating parts of this discussion. Uh, I think we always have to, as, these, as physicians, we have to distinguish whether we are advising people who are well what they should eat and people who are sick, how we can alter their diet and actually restore their health. Uh, in, in my particular practice with patients who are all sick with triple vessel coronary artery disease, I play hardball. I don't want them to have one single morsel past their lips that is going to further endanger their endothelium and its capacity to make nitric oxide. And <clears throat> we've shown time and again, we can, when they do this, we can halt the disease and we can often get reversal. But the point <clears throat> I want to make about wellness is I've been out on the circuit with this now for more years than I'd like to remember. It's possible that, uh, <clears throat> that I'm beginning to be, to be haunted somewhat by the fact that almost invariably in the audience that I'm facing, there are going to be persons who are sick that I'm addressing, and then there are going to be those that are well. And it's been haunting me more and more in the last year or two that really, who are the people who are sick? They were all the previously well. How did they get sick? By eating the foods that injured them. And some of those people in, took enough of those foods to injure them to the point where they got sick. I'm reminded of a study several years ago of 905,000 patient years of follow-up. And, and what happened in that particular subset that I was fascinated with were the men and women who were 55 years of age. And they had absolutely optimal risk factors. Their weight, their blood pressure, their cholesterol, everything was fine. And they followed them for 30 years. At age 85 now, 30% of the women and 40% of the men had now developed cardiovascular disease. So I, I think that uh, we have to kind of think carefully about those who are well today and what is the message that we want to give them to maintain them in that state. So, I work with a lot of patients that have autoimmune disease and you turn on and off their symptoms sometimes with a single dairy meal. I mean, they'll tell you because they'll inadvertently get exposed to something. And that one meal is enough to activate their symptoms. So as far as dairy products are concerned, I think your friend's experience is going to be pretty obvious. Most patients that stop using dairy products don't come back and say, oh, that wasn't worth the trouble. Because they can notice it when they do go back and have the occasional exposure, if they happen to be sensitive, as many autoimmune patients and other ill patients are. They can tell themselves very, very quickly. I don't have that same experience, for example, with fish exposure. You know, it doesn't have apparently the same type of antigenic response. Those people who need it, they may or may not notice. But with dairy products, I feel really strongly that the patient experience himself, if you can just get them to stop it for a week or two, 
they themselves can tell whether or not this is a health-promoting food or not. Um, while we're here, and there's um, seven of you, it's very easy to feel like this is the consensus. But when you go on the internet, there's all kinds of people, and on YouTube, and I want to read you something um, from someone who has her own following and um, your response. Um, Nina Teichelt, author of The Big Fat Surprise, Why Butter, Meat, and Cheese Belong in a Healthy Diet, wrote the following. Ronald M. Krauss decided in 2000 to review all the evidence purporting to show that saturated fats cause heart disease. Krauss is director of arterial sclerosis research at Children's Hospital, Oakland Research Institute, and an adjunct professor of nutritional studies at the University of San Francisco at Berkeley. Krauss concluded in 2010, after reviewing all the scientific literature, that saturated fats could not be said to cause heart disease. In March, another group of scientists, including faculty from Cambridge and Harvard, came to the same conclusion after conducting a similar meta-analysis. For instance, the Maasai worries in Kenya were observed in the 1970s eating nothing but meat, milk, and blood, not a vegetable in sight, yet they were not overweight, their cholesterol levels remained low, even as they aged, and scientists could find no evidence of heart disease, despite conducting electrocardiographs on 400 of them. In India, researchers studied a million railway workers and found that those in the north ate 8 to 19 percent more fat, mainly from dairy products, than their co-workers in the south, yet the northerners lived an average 12 years longer. This disparity led the study authors to conclude in a 1967 paper that to prevent heart disease, people ought to eat more fermented milk products such as yogurt, yogurt, sherbet, and butter half a world away. Scientists observed 80% fat. They should have been in a wretched state, wrote Vladimir Stephenson, the Harvard-trained Canadian anthropologist who lived in the... In Inuit for years, but to the contrary, they seem to be the healthiest people I ever lived with. The best possible science from the past decade now indicates that too many carbs overall, even of the supposedly healthy whole grain kind, increase the risk of these diseases compared with the diet low in carbohydrates. In other words, too much whole grain cereal for breakfast and whole grain pasta for dinner with fruit snacks in between add up to a less healthy diet than one of egg sausage followed by fish. Our dietary guidance has been followed by the, followed the Ansel Keys view for 50 years now. Despite a half a billion pounds spent trying to prove this hypothesis, the evidence of its health benefits have never been produced. Meanwhile, the rates of obesity and diabetes are rising, and heart disease remains a leading cause of death. Your thoughts? I'd, I'd be happy to take that on, although um, there's about 25 things you mentioned there. I can't be sure that I can remember all of those. But the main points uh, that, uh, yes, I, Dr. Coase is a colleague, and actually some of the very early papers were with our data and, on small LDL particles. Uh, but that particular paper that you mentioned uh, does bring up a very important uh, issue in uh, any kind of study, be it an epidemiologic study or a randomized controlled study, that the comparison always is really important and will affect the, the results. Uh, and in the kind of uh, analysis that most people did actually until uh, not too long ago, if they were looking at something like red meat in the diet, uh, they would look at red meat compared to everything else in the diet. And we already heard I can't remember who said it, that the, uh, that the average American diet quality is really low, that only about 2.5% uh, have an optimal diet by some criteria. By the dietary guidelines, only 5% of Americans meet the dietary guidelines. Uh, we've scored the national diet. It gets about 50 out of 100 score. In our, in our business, that's a pretty low F. Uh, so uh, if you're comparing red meat with that rest of the diet, and you don't find any difference, uh, it means that red, the red meat's as bad as the rest of the American diet, which is a huge amount of refined starch, sugar, and until recently a lot of trans fat as well. Uh, so the real issue is red meat compared to what we would think would be a healthy diet that would be predominantly plant-based protein sources, uh, like nuts, legumes, soy products, et cetera, with lots of fruits and vegetables and whole grain. And when you do that kind of analysis, uh, red meat uh, is, raises LDL in randomized controlled trials. And also, we see very clearly in the epidemiologic studies is related to higher risk of cardiovascular disease. Now, Ron Krauss 
and also the paper more recently that you mentioned, couldn't do that kind of analysis because they, that was a meta-analysis summarizing published papers, and those published papers had not done that kind of appropriate comparison looking at a healthy alternative, not just the rest of the junky American diet. Uh, and that, that's a fundamentally important point. I know Collins made that point earlier on, too, that the, uh, the comparison is, is critically important, whether it's an observational epidemiologic study or a randomized trial, the comparison uh, determines uh, to a very heavy, uh, heavy uh, degree the, what you'll have as the outcome. Uh, so a lot of these other sort of anecdotal uh, comparisons, uh, the Eskimos, uh, for example, Inuits, uh, that in re reality we don't really know what their health was, that uh, the best data we have is that they didn't live, haven't been living very long. Uh, so, uh, but we just simply haven't had good records. Uh, human beings are remarkable. We can survive and reproduce on an incredibly wide range of diets. Uh, we, we are adaptable. We've, um, uh, our evolution has equipped us to uh, exist for a, a while and reproduce on a, a very wide range of diets. Uh, but that doesn't mean that they're uh, going to be optimally healthy if we want to be living to age 70 or 80 uh, with the best function uh, that, we, that we possibly uh, can. Uh, so I think those, those kind of anecdotal comparisons uh, maybe get us started. They ask questions. It raises interesting questions about uh, the, what uh, Inuits have been eating and, and their health conditions, but it, it really is, uh, if you want, she's been critical of uh, epidemiologic studies, but she raises the crudest kind of epidemiologic study to, to try to make a point. Now, she also raised the point about uh, 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 carbohydrates versus fat, and there's a, now a huge amount of data to say that the percentage of calories in, in, the, in the diet from fat is really not important. Uh, all kinds of studies, but the quality of the fat and the quality of the carbohydrate is very important. Um, the plant sources of fat are, have positive health values, um, and, uh, and the quality of the carbohydrate, whole grains, especially intact whole grains, have a very different effect than refined starches do. Uh, and in the studies from India, th there is a real issue. Uh, uh, in most of the diets around the world people are eating, they are consuming too much carbohydrate, probably in, in general, uh, often 80% of calories from carbohydrate, and increasingly it's refined carbohydrate. Uh, so a lot, of the, a lot of what would have been consumed by the uh, South Indians there would certainly be very far from what we see as an optimal diet. It would be very unbalanced until very recently, very little fruit and vegetables. Uh, and for the most part, what we've called poverty diet, the cheapest thing, which is a lot of carbohydrate and increasingly refined carbohydrate. So we really can't gain, uh, can't conclude very much from that kind of study. I, I, I was really, I was hoping Walter would step up and go first with that. I, I was tempting to go with what a shocking load of rubbish. <laughs> kind of leave it at that. But Walter did a much better job. But just a couple things to append. In 2020, we no longer have the privilege of talking about diet for human health without considering environmental impact, even, even if it were true, and it's not, but even if it were true that your diet could be optimal if you were eating red meat and high intake of saturated fat routinely, if it's going to destroy the planet, frankly, Scarlett, who gives a damn? I, do, I don't understand that blind spot in the carnivorous argument. There are no healthy people. There are no healthy people on a ruined, ravaged planet. It's our one shared home. All dietary discussions have to factor that in. So uh, completely omitted. Walter went over all of the epidemiology, and I completely agree. The one thing that I would append, there's a shibboleth in the mix here. And that's the notion, and you hear it all the time from this particular writer and many others. We've had this dietary advice to cut back on saturated fat for a long time, and yet we're fatter and sicker. Therefore, the advice was wrong. Uh, no, we never took it. And besides, there's more than one way to eat badly, and the American public is totally invested in exploring them all. So. 
we never really cut back much on saturated fat, but to whatever little extent we did, we loaded up on snack wells. We weren't eating more broccoli, robin lentils. And so what we wound up with was a higher intake of total calories, a high intake of refined carbohydrate, and for the most part, an excess of saturated fat relative to recommendations into the bargain. You can't say the advice was wrong if all of the data you have about bad outcomes pertain to people who never followed the advice in the first place. And then in terms of why we never followed the advice, Pam, I think that's in your sweet spot because the marketing of all the junk food was highly effective, right? When we were fascinated with cutting fat, if all there had been were wholesome, natural foods to do it with, maybe we would have eaten those, but immediately we got snack wells and low-fat junk food. When we became obsessed with cutting carbs, there was a whole suite of low-carb junk foods. Now you can have gluten-free junk food, and you know, they, basically you can have any flavor of junk food you want, and that's all marketed very successfully. So we never followed any sensible guidance, and for the most part, we still don't. I'll, I'll add something to that as well. I think that um, a couple of things worth mentioning. Um, one is that uh, there was a recent study, 2018, I think it was Seidelman's group, that, that looked at uh, carbohydrate intake and, uh, and, and mortality risk. And, and in fact, uh, those eating the least amount of carbohydrate had a 32% increase in mortality. Uh, the folks that had, uh, as a group, the, the, the lowest mortality were consuming about 50 to 55 percent of calories from carbohydrates. And then at the other end of the spectrum, the people eating the most carbohydrates had about a 23 percent increase in risk. However, uh, the, the, the uh, research team said that, that it was very clear that there was a segment of that group uh, that had higher mortality, that their carbohydrates were coming from refined foods. And of course, you can't remove everything of value to human health from a food, add a bunch of crap to it, and expect it to support health. That doesn't happen. Uh, but what was really interesting was that the, the, the other end of that high carbohydrate group w was actually the lowest risk of mortality of all uh, uh, segments of, of, of that particular population. And those, I would expect, were the people that were getting their carbohydrates from foods that were packaged with fiber and phytochemicals and antioxidants and everything else. And that, and that study went another step, and they, they looked at replacing carbohydrates. If you replaced uh, uh, carbohydrates with, with animal protein, you increased mortality 18%. But if you replaced uh, carbohydrates with plant protein, you actually reduced mortality by 18%. And that tells us something. And then the second thing I would like to mention is people need to understand sometimes uh, research can take a slant uh, that, that we might not necessarily uh, recognize based on headlines, butter is back and so forth. I think one of the best um, uh, summaries of what we know about the effect of fats on, on human health and saturated fat in particular was the presidential report from 2017. And, uh, and, and they concluded what we know, saturated fat increases risk of heart disease. But what's really interesting uh, was I remember when the 2014 Chowdhury study came out um, it, it, that that concluded that, that saturated fat has been vindicated, essentially. And those studies that, that, that suggested saturated fat has been vindicated, I don't think any of them actually showed saturated fat has been vindicated. Rather, if you replace saturated fat with refined carbohydrates, you're no further ahead. Uh, if you replace saturated fat with polyunsaturated fat, you are further ahead. So th those are the kinds of things that we learned from these studies. But one of the things I thought was particularly interesting was I, I realized that one of the authors or co-authors on that study had been a researcher with Epic Oxford. And I, I, I asked her, I said, can you, can you 
explain the findings of this study? Well, she said, it's very simple. She said, I had no idea that she, she was involved in the beginning. And she said, in the beginning, when they did this study, uh, we, we found that there was a 19% increased risk in, in heart disease uh, with uh, increased intake of saturated fat. I can't remember all of the details, but she said the study was rejected by the journal we submitted it to. So the, so, so the, the lead author reworked the data, removing uh, certain things until there was a different result and the study was accepted. And she said, in no way does that study change anything we know about um, saturated fat and its impact on heart disease. As far as I'm concerned, and she was one of the co-authors, we still need to be restricting saturated fat. That's a very interesting story that the journal basically changed the conclusions. And I heard that from another co-author on the paper and the other co who, was not, uh, who was not told by the primary author that they had basically changed the data and the conclusion. And it's very curious because it was the same journal and the same editor that just pushed this story about you can eat all the red meat you want to. Yeah. Very interesting. Yeah, that's disturbing. I just uh, great comments by Brenda and raised some good points about the studies. Just one thing, she mentioned a presidential report. That was the American Heart Association president. It wasn't Trump. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> okay, I'd like to ask each of you a different question. Good point. You could you could all uh answer each of your own questions and comment on someone else's if you like. Um, I'm gonna ask them all at once and then you could each answer it. Dr. Katz, you mentioned in a previous talk that 23,000 people in a study had an 80% less lifetime risk of all major chronic diseases such as heart disease, stroke, diabetes, cancer, and dementia. What did these people do to achieve this result? Dr. Willett, tell us about the study out of Harvard that showed the higher that showed the higher the percentage of total calories from saturated fat from meat processed meat, dairy and processed dairy, the higher the rate of premature death from all causes, uh, the higher the percentage of fat from unsaturated sources, the lower the rate of premature death. Dr. Campbell, in chapter 13 of the China study, what did you mean by science, the dark side? Dr. Esselstein, um, why do you say we have built a billion dollar industry around an illness that does not even exist on half the planet? Is it really possible to be heart attack proof or is that just a way to get everyone's attention? Do you, I mean, can we really go to, what, what does that mean? Does that mean we could really completely eliminate the risk? Dr. Goldhammer, what is the ideal fasting schedule for a person who is going to do it from home? Should they fast one day a week for each month, once every three months? What, what is, how long would the fast be um, if they wanted to do it from home? Dr. Popper and Brenda Davis. Our audience is probably predominantly women, and it's probably more of an over 40 audience. Um, what is the reality for premenopause and menopause? In other words, what should women expect their hormones, their emotional state, their physical state, their sex drive to be. It seems like it's an under-discussed topic, and women are led to believe that they're supposed to be like they are in their 30s when it's completely a different situation, and it's not really addressed. So what is the realistic expectation of what they should be expecting, and what can they do to make it the most comfortable experience? Anyone can start and answer your question. Well, I'll go first. I'm better now than I was in my 30s. <laughs> in my 30s, I was still eating cheese and I was fat, so this is a whole lot better. Um, I think that the, the thing that we have done in the United States is we have medicalized women's stages of life. Women can't have a menstrual period without some kind of intervention. They have trouble getting pregnant. Pregnancy is treated like a disease. Menopause is a disease that requires treatment. And I always think about how it must have been when we were hunter-gatherers and cave dwellers and somebody said, well, I can't go looking for food today. I'm PMSing. I mean, seriously, this is not the way we were designed to live. 
So what happens at menopause is that it all catches up with you. You know, the bad habits, the, the, the excessive eating, being overweight, not exercising, not taking care of yourself. The older you get, the more this stuff catches up with you. And so most of the women who come to me to talk about what do I do about menopause, I'm miserable. If you ask them enough questions, they'll tell you that they were miserable when they had their first menstrual period, now at the age of eight, unfortunately. It used to be a lot older than that. Um, and then ever since then, they've been having problems. So the key is the earlier you start taking care of yourself, the more uneventful this will be. And uneventful meaning it doesn't really change much other than we are all getting older and we can't do much about that, darn it, because I'd love to stick around for a couple hundred more years if I could. But if you have reached the age of menopause, now what you have to do is the accelerated program. In other words, you got to get in the gym and take off that weight and go to hot yoga and start sleeping well and eat an optimal diet and get yourself hydrated and you got to stop running around after everything on the planet except for yourself. I mean, I've been thinking about writing a book called Me First, Why You Should Take Care of Yourself Before You Worry About Everything Else on the Planet. And the good news about women who are in this condition is they're willing to do anything, even go to the gym and eat plants. I mean, they're really miserable. And one of the best things that's helped in terms of motivating them is some of the more recent studies that have come out. One large one recently showed that um, any hormone replacement, estrogen alone, progesterone alone, the combination together, any period of time you take it, increases your risk of breast cancer. So women are once again feeling a little terrified of hormone replacement, which they should be, and they're very motivated to approach this from a diet and lifestyle perspective, so that's all good. Uh, Steve, can I ask you, did I have the same question as Pam? Uh, yes. Oh, okay, well, I guess we may as well. <laughs> I'll contribute as well. Um, you know, I, I completely agree, of, you know, talking about uh, how you feel even better than you did when you were in your uh, 30s. Um, I can honestly say I don't really feel much different than I did when I was in my 30s. And, and I'm 61 years old now, and, and I've been married for, well, it'll be 42 years uh, this year. And, um, and yes, um, certainly after menopause, things can change a little bit. But, you know, I, I think that the most important thing is that you're making healthy choices in every aspect of your life, balancing your life in terms of your family, um, what you do socially, but also, of course, all of the healthy choices you make. But the thing that people need to realize is that if you keep doing what you're doing, making healthy choices in your 20s and 30s and 40s and so on, uh, things don't change quite as quickly. And, and so, I, I mean, honestly, and not to be braggy or anything, but I think I can still run as fast as I did in my 30s. I can still do the splits and headstands and handstands and, you know, all of those things, the push-ups and all of those things, it doesn't... I, I'm, I find that it's not changing quickly, and I'm really hoping that uh, it'll continue. I, I absolutely love this story that John Robbins uh, tells in one of his books about this 96-year-old, I think he was 96-year-old um, martial artist who was pitted against a 39-year-old world champion boxer for the Millennium Celebrations. And these two men um, were put in the ring and, and the boxer was just, he just kept trying to hit this old man and the old man kept dodging him. And after about 20 minutes, uh, the, 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 the young boxer was, was getting really tired, lost his concentration, the old man flattened him. And, and of course the reporters came running and they said to the young guy, well, what happened? How can you explain this? He said, I don't know, but the old man just beat me. They went to the old man and they said, well, uh, you know, how can you explain beating a 39-year-old box, a world champion boxer? And, and the old man said, I don't understand why anyone's surprised. I have far more experience than he does. And, uh, and I think we can all uh, take a lesson uh, from that. But I, I, 
you know, uh, as um, in terms of diet and, and going through menopause and so forth, it's the same song and dance all over again. A lot of greens and beans, and I, I actually didn't really um, notice menopause, to be honest. Uh, it, I didn't f feel much of anything. Uh, I felt I felt fine. I didn't have a lot of uh, hot flashes or anything like that. I do eat uh, soy on a pretty regular basis. I eat a lot of greens. I eat, I eat very healthfully. I eat plenty of essential fatty acids and so forth. And so I, I, I think that's just um, a lot of the experience of a lot of people who eat a, uh, a, either exclusively or largely plant-based diet that they sail through fairly, um, fairly easily. I, I told Brenda I thought she still was in her 30s, so. <laughs> so my question was about uh, Earl Ford's study, 2009. Uh, the journal at the time was called the Archives of Internal Medicine. It's now JAMA Internal Medicine. Healthy living is the best revenge. It, it was a nested cohort analysis within something called the EPIC trial, which is a long, multi-year prospective study in countries throughout Europe looking at cancer and, and other chronic disease outcomes. So what was interesting to me about the Ford study is that it was the other side of the coin that launched my career in lifestyle medicine. So I already told you about that first phase, 1993 actual causes of death in the United States, Bill Fagy, Mike McGinnis, 80% of all premature death and chronic disease is attributable to bad use of feet, forks, and fingers and almost 100% of premature death is explainable by modifiable factors. The Ford study, which came out in 2009, was survey analysis involving 23,000 people living in and around Potsdam, Germany, and the study focused on four factors. Do you smoke, yes or no? Do you eat well, yes or no? And a very simplistic definition of that, eating well was habitual intake of fruits, vegetables, and whole grains, and not eating well was the absence of that. Are you physically active on a regular basis, and that was also dichotomized, yes or no, and do you have a healthy weight, yes or no? And they went on to compare the two ends of the spectrum over the multiple years of the study, and you know, back to Pam's contention that if we could put this in a pill, it would be the best medicine the world has ever known. So. The people who had four good answers, I don't smoke, I eat well, I'm active, my weight's fine, had an 80% lesser incidence of all major chronic disease over the multi-year span of the study than people who had four bad answers, I smoke, eat badly, don't exercise, my weight's not so good. If you flip the switch from bad to good on any one of these factors, the probability of developing any major chronic disease went down about 50%, but fire on all four cylinders, it's an apparent 80% reduction, as best we know from other data sources, it's lifelong. 80% reduction in the risk of ever getting heart disease, cancer, stroke, diabetes, dementia, all the things we don't want to have happen to us. Now, some of these conditions are much more modifiable than others. We could virtually eliminate type 2 diabetes, we could virtually eliminate coronary disease, we probably have a little less control over cancer. But when you aggregate all major chronic disease and look at that as one variable, 80% reduction by not smoking, eating well, being active, healthy weight. This was just one study, but to me it was quite provocative because the McGinnis and Fagy study said, here's all the bad stuff that happens if you get these wrong. The Ford study was a beautiful rebuttal saying, if you get them right, Here's all the good stuff. Could you repeat the question for me again? I didn't hear the last time. Yes. Um, in your book, The China Study, chapter 13, um, you, the title was called Science, the Dark Side. What did you mean by that? Well, first off, let me say I've enjoyed a career in science, and I love science. I love the, the basic uh, customs and, and uh, rules and regulations, if, you, if I can call them that, the practices. Um, I just like the concept of science because, for me, 
it, if we do it right, uh, do it as well as we can, it really is a, it's a force that just drives toward being honest, for one thing, being objective, just one force in oneself to, to live that way. Uh, so I, I think of science in a classical sense as being a really delightful sort of discipline to work in. I enjoyed it a great deal. But what I have seen, unfortunately, over the years, particularly having been involved in policy activities for some pretty intensively for about 20 years, um, I've just come to realize, unfortunately, uh, that we confuse the word science with technology. The, pu the public tend to think of scientific evidence in a sort of a, uh, a singular way. It's either evidence or it's not evidence. When in fact, uh, what I find is that uh, so much of the thing that we call uh, evidence, scientific evidence, particularly in the media and so forth, um, really is, uh, is, a, a technolo is technology in a sense. People are doing work to prove a certain point, which in, in many ways doesn't exactly square with what science is all about. Uh, science to me is the art of observation. You see something, you see something possibly interesting. And so there at that point, you know, if you're really into research, you sort of start asking some questions and always being prepared to get either one answer or the other answer, being prepared to be wrong and admit it, being prepared to uh, offer your findings to others to criticize. I mean, I like that whole engagement of uh, the back and forth and, and that sort of thing. And unfortunately, especially having been in the policy community for pretty intensively for quite some years, um, I see the corporate sector. I see the hand of the corporate sector becoming ever so strong, so strong. And so in that particular case, uh, people, for whatever reason, consciously or unconsciously, paid or unpaid, uh, tend to uh, really want to prove a point, want to prove a point. And so too often those points being proved, if, if you will, are, are very specific items of information. They're missing the big story. And uh, I, I find just, for example, the conversation we've been just having here uh, tonight, to some extent, uh, is really very, very you know, nice conversation on the one hand. But I think we, we have to worry a little bit about getting caught in the weeds, getting caught in the weeds, talking about you know, specifically saturated fat, for example. Uh, saturated fat is, is the, the bad guy in the, in the block, has been for a long time, supposedly. Unsaturated fat for plants is, the, is a good thing. But in reality, the saturated fat story, I think, has been vastly overdone. It's one, just I'm using it as an example. Uh, we're just putting our finger on saturated fat or cholesterol, whatever. Over 100 years ago, it was shown in the laboratory that saturated fat was not the key determinant of the level of cholesterol in the blood, for example. It was animal protein. It was animal protein. And that research started in 1909 with an observation by a Russian fellow, but then continued for the next uh, 15 years, I think it was, several research groups looking at that question. Finally, in 1923 and again in 26, uh, there came a, a sort of a, a, a statement from the group at the University of Michigan claiming there's been beyond proof, essentially, I mean, he said it very strongly, that group said it very strongly, saturated fat was not the cause of high cholesterol levels. Consuming saturated fat, it really was protein, which animal protein in particular. Uh, that in turn energized me to some extent because uh, then one starts to ask questions, well, how does, how does protein really work? You know, we're looking at some mechanisms and so forth. How does it intervene in the synthesis of cholesterol and that kind of thing? And you, pretty soon you start getting lost in the weeds and then all of a sudden we realize that, that the animal protein, at least seen in epidemiological studies, is an indication of a much larger change in our dietary scope. So when we start thinking then about the right relationship between diet and, and disease, heart disease, cancer, and so forth and so on, um, the, just the mere notion, just the mere notion for people to say, I want to eat animal protein, I need it, which means in turn, you know, eating animal-based foods, which then distorts the diet. So it, it sort of, for me at least, it stretches my thought pattern into a much larger scope and try, try to put my hands on something that I can say, but really has breadth to it. It really has breadth to it. And so um, that's coming back to the scientific question again. I, I, uh, I just find too much of the science that's being done in our institutions, 
in our academic institution in particular, being um, compromised by the influence of the corporate sector. And I think it's getting worse. <laughs> well, I'll leave it at that <laughs> for your thoughts. I think that the uh, <clears throat> question of uh, how you change a billion dollar uh, cardiovascular uh, injury, how do you get rid of it? I think there are several uh, thoughts uh, along this line. I should share with you uh, a, an editorial that I'm working on now, and I haven't quite decided where I'll try to submit this. <laughs> but it has to do with one of the organizations which I am a member of, the American College of Cardiology, and the American Heart Association. Because <clears throat> historically, what was so fascinating about smallpox, we got rid of it. Why? We treated the causation of it. We got rid of poliomyelitis. Why? We treated the causation. At the turn of the century, from 1899 to 1900, in that area, era, we had what? We had this great understanding of bacteria. And as sewage disposal and clean water became paramount, well, there was a huge increase in survival and get rid of hundreds of thousands of diseases. Because we were treating the causation. Now, how long? It's really been almost since the turn of the century, early 1900s, that suddenly, uh, I guess it was William Osler in 1899, giving an address. He talked about angina, but he had never seen a case. But by 1910, William Osler was talking about angina, and he was aware of, really, uh, 40 or 50 or more cases. So now we had this illness that was building up in this country that to become number one. Now along comes the American Heart Association, the American College of Cardiology, and you know, they've been around about 70, 80 years or more. And we have tens of thousands of papers from these organizations and even uh, uh, beyond that. Plus, they have these annual meetings. We get a bulletin every month, and we get a, a journals every week. And yet, still, cardiovascular disease is number one. So I looked at this a little bit more carefully. And who do you suppose are the sponsors of the American Heart Association? You ever hear about the Montana Beef Council? Kentucky Beef Council? Iowa Beef Council? Kraft, Domino's, pizza. There's something that got, struck me as being a little peculiar about all this. And <clears throat> then you look at the American College of Cardiology, and it's turned a little differently, but there it's mostly all the different 20 other pharmaceutical houses. Then where the rubber really hit the road was I looked at the guy at dietary guidelines. Yep, it's OK. They had <clears throat> vegetables, they had fruit, and <clears throat> yeah, they had grain. Then they also had meat, and then they also had dairy, and then they had oils, and then they had sugary drinks. What is this? This was an absolute denial of the science of disease causation in these very same organizations that are supposed to be at the forefront of stopping heart disease. And you look at, in, the, in a very simplistic way, of, of some of the civilizations that don't seem to have heart disease. What about the Papua Highlanders? The Papua Highlanders are fascinating. They live in this high, absolutely serene uh, arena in these mountains, and yet, what is their leading cause of death? Lung disease. Why? Well, they all seem to <clears throat> smoke this very harsh tobacco, 19 different, uh, excuse me, a very harsh tobacco, and when they smoke it, they smoke it in a large communal hutch, so everybody gets the benefit of everybody else's smoke. But when they autopsy these people, over 60, their arteries are clean, even with all that smoking. What's going on? They thrive on 19 different varieties of sweet potato. 
Fascinating. And the other group you look at, of course, are the Tarahumara Indians in northern Mexico. What do they thrive on? The three sisters, beans, corn, and squash. Heart disease, virtually non-existent, fantastic athletes. Then we always heard about the Maasai. The Maasai in Africa are thriving. They're the exception. They're thriving on dairy and blood and meat, milk, and uh, so George Mann, an American Journal of Epidemiology in 1972, decided he would go over and settle this question, see how these grass-fattened beef were so safe for everybody. <laughs> they did 50 autopsies. The Maasai are loaded with atherosclerosis. Yeah. So <clears throat> I guess in summary, what I want to say is I think that there are some forces here at work that really perhaps try to keep us a little bit off the trail. And that's why I'm so proud and delighted to places like what this Melville, Long Island, where what Steve Shore has done in bringing this cast of characters together. To <laughs> <laughs> to, to try to share with you some science. Thank you. Did everyone answer that question? Oh, go ahead. You asked me the question about uh, this very large uh, population that we studied looking at types of fat in relation to uh, total mortality and also cause, cause specific mortality. This was uh, a summary combining our three large cohorts, which in this analysis we started off excluding anybody who had any major disease. So we had about 130,000 people and we've tracked their diets for up to 30 or so years. And during that time, about 30,000 of our participants died. Uh, unfortunately, and, and we all will at some point in time, but that gave us a, a lot of information. I must say, this work has really only been possible because of the committed participants in our study. They're all registered nurses or other health professionals. Some other, uh, the men are other health professionals uh, who uh, essentially what we've done is set up a framework for them to share their personal experiences, what they eat, medications, family history, sleep, um, physical activity, all of that. So when we want to look at a question uh, like saturated fat, we can adjust for all of those other variables. Uh, and uh, again, th this would not have been possible without the unprecedented uh, commitment to this research by the uh, many uh, tens of thousands of participants. So in this analysis, we took a sort of deep dive looking up type of fat in relation to, again, total mortality and uh, cause specific mortality. And uh, in the, the comparison here, again, we were specific about the comparison, which was carbohy total carbohydrate intake. And we, do, we did see there was an association of, of greater mortality with higher intake of saturated fat compared to, uh, uh, compared to carbohydrate. This is the analysis that Ron Krauss couldn't do in his uh, the paper that you mentioned earlier that was quoted by Nina Teicholz. Uh, and of course, we also looked at trans fat, which is sort of off the chart and how bad that was. And uh, partly for this, this kind of data from these studies, uh, we've, we've eliminated trans fat. It's not legal as of uh, 2018 in the United States. Uh, but we did also find that unsaturated fat from particularly plant sources of monounsaturated fat, and interestingly, even more so, uh, polyunsaturated fat was related to lower mortality a lower risk of heart disease. Uh, and there's a big myth out there that polyunsaturated fat or especially omega-6 is bad for you. It's pro-inflammatory. There's dozens of studies that have looked at that. Omega-6 fatty acid is not pro-inflammatory. It actually tends to reduce inflammatory factors in the blood and uh, is an in sen creates uh, more sensitivity to insulin, it looks like. Uh, so uh, interestingly enough, there was a strong inverse, a lower risk of uh, total mortality with a uh, higher intake of uh, sources of polyunsaturated fat. Now, I agree with, Co with Colin that, that uh, we have to be a bit careful about uh, 
somehow uh, too much reductionist, focusing on just specific nutrients. But I think it's sort of like the proverbial uh, Indian uh, blind men feeling an elephant, that it's really something as complicated as diet. It's useful to look at it from a number of different perspectives. Uh, and looking at it from this whole dietary pattern is really important. And, and we've done a lot more of that recently. Uh, bringing it down to foods is really important because that's we make our choices among foods and bringing it down. But I also think we do want to learn about specific nutrients and looking at it from that more uh, mechanistic lens as well. It does help us understand what's really going on and the fact that we uh, there is this association both in randomized controlled trials uh, f with feeding saturated fat does increase LDL cholesterol, no question about it. Um, and we see the same pattern when we look at risk of uh, total mortality or cardiovascular disease. And that kind of information uh, can help us generalize uh, uh, and uh, make decisions where we can't do a, a randomized trial, say, of olive oil versus uh, soybean oil. Uh, and to look at uh, over a couple of decades, uh, total mortality, something like that. So th this kind of information can uh, tell us uh, along with other types of information that uh, if we have to take a choice and people are going to eat oils in their diet, that uh, more unsaturated kind of oils would be better than uh, like palm oil that's uh, uh, highly saturated. Uh, and this is important because globally, by far the greatest uh, source of fat is palm oil. Diet. It's, it actually is probably, uh, cutting down rainforest is not a good idea for sure, but you, we don't have to grow palm oil, produce palm oil in, in rainforest territory. We can produce in another kind of territory. And, um, uh, and uh, from other standpoint, palm oil production actually can be a relatively ecological, good, favorable source of uh, producing oil. Uh, I must say, in this Eat Lancet report that uh, David mentioned, uh, feeding what will be about 10 billion people on our planet by 2050 is a big challenge. Whatever we do, it will have big footprints. Uh, just because 10 billion people are eating is going to have big footprints. So uh, we're, uh, there's been a lot of negativity about uh, palm oil production, but soybean oil also has a, a big negative impact as well. Every, every place we put down uh, 10 billion feet, no, it's going to be 20 billion feet. There's going to be big footprints. Each person has two footprints. So um, this, this is one just piece of the evidence can help us make decisions. But it does say, it does say that in general, that, that um, in our diets, that saturated fat was coming from uh, dairy products and, and, and red meat primarily. And uh, what we see is uh, if we then sort of look, step back, look at it, at it, the bigger picture, this is one more reason why a lot of uh, dairy products uh, and uh, red meat in the diet is not going to be good for us. Could I just add just a quick comment, uh, Walt, as to what you were saying? I, I don't mean to say that you know we should shift the balance from all reduction research, for example, to all holist research. Right. We've got to obviously take into consideration both types very clearly. Yeah. I mean, the reductionist side is the details make the whole. Right. So what we what what we do, unfortunately, in research and in clinical practice, I would argue too. Sometimes we focus almost exclusively on the reductionist ideas at the expense. Right. I'm looking at a larger picture. That's my that's my main point. Yeah, I completely so, agree with you. We've gone way overboard in in that direction. Right. I, I fully agree with you. Right. So my question was about what people can do on their own, and I think everybody should fast every day uh, for a period of between 12 and 16 hours, depending on what your goals are and your circumstance. And some people say, well, how do, you, how do you do that? I get hungry, I get cravings. A lot of the reason why people are getting hungry and cravings is because of what they're eating. If you're eating refined carbohydrates and you're uh, stimulating your body to have excess insulin production, which drives your sugars down, which tells your brain that you're starving, of course you're going to have cravings. That's what a lot of those cravings are, is a reaction to a very poor uh, dietary choices. But once you adopt a whole plant food SOS free diet, you find your blood sugar levels tend to be much more stable. It makes it much more, uh, much easier to make good decisions about what you eat from meal to meal. And it also makes it possible for you to fast for a period of 12 to 16 hours every day. 
by not eating right before you go to sleep for a few hours, by uh, delaying uh, the morning uh, meal perhaps, so that you get that period of fasting, there's evidence to suggest that even that period of the fasting, cumulatively, um, uh, can re uh, increase glycemic control, reduce the recurrence of conditions like breast cancer, regardless of the other variables in the diet. But if the other variables in the diet are good, you're eating a whole plant food SOS-free diet, you'll find that this is a rather easy thing to do uh, compared to people on conventional feeding programs. Just quickly, Alan, um, or Dr. Goldhammer, uh, do you recommend once a month that we do a full day water fast at home? Now, I recommend that people do between 12 and 16 hours a day of fasting. There's actually good evidence of the benefit of 12 hours a day fasting as a routine. Uh, there's some suggestion that extending that to as much as 16 hours may be beneficial. But beyond that, I'd recommend that medically supervised water-only fasting be done when long periods of fasting are going to be entertained. So you're not saying that if we were willing to three, four times a year, you know, for a full 36-hour period at our home, do a water fast, you're not recommending I don't that. think that we have evidence that supports those types of recommendations at this point. Okay. All right, I'm going to ask everyone another series. Sorry. Um, I'm going to ask everyone another series of questions, and I guess you could try to keep these answers to just two minutes, okay? Um, so the questions are, uh, Dr. Goldhammer, you are saying to do a no salt, no sugar, no oil diet, so if you're against oil, what fats do you recommend, such as avocados, nuts, seeds, um, olives? So that's your question. Dr. Katz, in October of 2015, the World Health Organization said red meat has the same level of carcinogenicity as smoking cigarettes. Please explain this, and are there any studies this dramatic about chicken, turkey, or pork? Brenda, um, what does the evidence say about eggs, or even egg whites? Um, uh, Dr. Willett, what percentage of the studies rev you review are not biased or paid for by someone with a vested interest in the study. In other words, there was a New York Post article two months ago that said red meat is good. So for those of us um, who are just reading studies, you know, what, what percentage of these studies are actually accurate, unbiased, not paid for by someone? Um, sorry about that. Uh, Dr. Um, Esselstein. Isn't it possible that when you did your studies that the studies worked not because people gave up nuts, but that, that it, isn't it possible that your studies would have worked out just as well if the people were also eating seeds and nuts? Okay. And um, Dr. Campbell, you say that only 9% of university profession, professors are on tenure and can't get fired. Why does this matter, whether professors are on tenure or just a paid employee? And should we be considering university studies and information out of universities as accurate? And finally, Dr. Popper, um, I want to go back. Margaret Paul was here on Sunday of last week. And she was very clear. She was saying that men and women sexually have a different sex drive and that, or, or different experience that once women go through menopause, that in many cases they have less test, um, whatever the hormone is, and they are more likely to connect first emotionally than sexually, and that therefore it's not really realistic to, for women to have this expectation when they reach you know, their 50s or whenever menopause is happening that they should be like they are when they're younger, yet society keeps telling them that they're supposed to be, and we're shaming and blaming and judging women when the reality is the, it is it is normal to have a significant change. And I guess I want to validate this. I'm concerned that if you and Brenda are saying, look, I feel the same way I felt in my 20s and 30s, and there's all these women who are thinking, I feel totally different, that they're going to think there's something wrong with them when Margaret is saying, no, that's the norm. The norm is for women to feel significantly different, especially um, sexually. So if each of you would answer your question in a, in, with a two-minute answer. So I can start with my question because it's simple. Um, we rec the diet that we serve at the True North Health Center typically is around 15 to 18 percent of calories from fat, or around 10 percent of calories from protein, the balance from whole plant food carbohydrates. And so that allows for the inclusion of small amounts of nuts or seeds up to an ounce a day 
uh, in the diet or, or limited quantities of, uh, of higher fat vegetable foods like avocado. We don't use any kind of oil uh, of any kind and we certainly don't use any animal products. Okay, I'll go next. Um, on the issue of, of menopause and sex drive and all that sort of thing, I, it's complicated. And the reason is that um, the, if women took care of themselves all through their lives, menopause would be a non-event. Now that doesn't mean that things don't change. Your relationship with your significant other changes. I mean, there are a lot of things that go into how much sex you wanna have and who you wanna have it with, right? So I talk to women who are overweight and malnourished and dehydrated and sedentary and they don't feel good and it makes you not wanna do anything. Sex is just one more of those things that you don't wanna do, right? I talk to women who really don't like their husbands very much. And sometimes it's easier to say I'm going through menopause than it is to say I don't like you anymore. <laughs> if I could have gotten out of here, I would have done it 25 years ago, you know? So, so that's a factor. Um, so I think that, um, you know, in response to this woman who spoke last weekend, yes, things change and they can change, but, um, it, and, and one thing I will say, vaginal dryness is an exception to the rule and that's easy enough to fix with, with over-the-counter products that don't contain hormones and aren't dangerous and, and that sort of thing and we recommend them regularly. But, but other than that, um, I think this is an issue of how you take care of yourself, how you feel about yourself, uh, your state of health, and the relationship that you have with somebody else. And that's highly variable. And um, I don't think that we can basically say that all women go through menopause and, and it just all goes to hell. I don't think that that's what my experience and a lot of other people's experience has been. And I think for women who have had that experience, I think that there are a lot of mitigating factors and it isn't just hormonal changes. Yeah, question I had was about funding of research and I haven't actually tried to get a tally of how many, what percentage of studies are uh, one way or another supported by industry, uh, but it's too, very, way too high. Uh, and sometimes it's not very obvious, it's indirect. Uh, and it, we re if we want less biased research, we need to pay for it. Uh, and that means public funding through NIH, that's the main mechanism. And uh, there's way too little funding for such an important topic. We've, been com we've become infatuated with genetics and things like that that are really, there'll be some benefits around the margin, but it's not gonna uh, have a huge impact on the really major causes of, of ill health that we have in our society. So there's huge imbalance in the public research uh, community, uh, partly because there's a lot of potential payoffs and gold, mi uh, gold mines of patents and things like that in the genetic area. Uh, that, uh, but we're not going to have ourselves in, in the nutrition research that we do. Uh, I was asked specifically about the, the study, it was this red meat study that we talked about saying you can eat all the red meat that you want to eat and it, it'll have, it's not a problem for health uh, in the Annals of Internal Medicine. As it, the reviewers claim, the authors claim no conflict of interest, but it came out of the New York Times that the uh, one of the authors, the first author, Dr. Johnson, was in fact uh, paid by uh, a front for the uh, uh, soda industry, uh, and which a couple of years ago they exonerated sugar, the same author, the same journal, same editor. Uh, and uh, then the Washington Post came out with a story oh, that the, there was only one senior nutritionist on this paper, where you'd expect a, a review of red meat would have a lot of experienced nutritionists on it, who had done research in this area. One senior nutritionist hadn't done research in this area, but uh, is a, the uh, chancellor and dean for the Department of Agriculture at Texas A&M University. Uh, and that, uh, it, some would interpret that possibly as a conflict of interest. Washington Post uh, article uh, talked about that and a couple other paper stories have more recently. It's sort of like saying, you know, if there's a big review on health effects of potatoes and the only nutritionist on there is the dean of the Department of Agriculture at the University of Idaho. Now isn't there, uh, you might su suspect there could be a little conflict of interest there.
by the way, if you look on the Texas A&M website, December 26, it declares big story, National Bacon Day. And actually, at first I thought, oh, this is really good, you know. There's one day of the year you can have bacon. No, but that wasn't what the story was about. <laughs> uh, the question was whether or not we could still get the same reversal of cardiovascular disease if the patients were having nuts and, and seeds. And if you ever look at my book on page 69 and on 70, you'll see that where I define that for patients who do not, have, do not have heart disease, I have no restriction on nuts and seeds. As a matter of fact, with patients with, flat, with heart disease, I encourage them with either flaxseed meal or chia seeds. And if they have a bun with a few sesame seeds, I don't have a problem with that. But with patients with heart disease, when I started this back in 1985, and we didn't have a lot of the knowledge we had then, but I just knew that I didn't want them to have a lot of saturated fat. So I asked for the heart patients to give up nuts. I, didn't, I, hadn't, I had no restrictions on patients who didn't have heart disease restricting their nuts. But uh, for heart disease, no nuts. Now, could it be okay for the patients who have heart disease to have three or four or five walnuts every day? Probably yes but you will not hear me say that. <laughs> Why? Why? If anybody ever hears that I said that at this conference, they don't remember I said it, three half walnuts on your cereal. They would say, Esselstyn said nuts were okay. And then what happens, they are so addicting. They're gonna be in the glove compartment. They're gonna be in the hallway. They're gonna be in the bathroom, the basement, the living room, the workbench. They are so addicting, and that's all that saturated fat. That's the last thing that I want my patients seriously ill with heart disease to have. And also, to me, there's, there's yet to be a single study of patients seriously ill with heart disease where you give them peanut butter, cashew sauce, and all the nuts they want, and you arrest and reverse their disease. That hasn't been there. Now, there's a thing called Predimed. Predimed. A little peculiar because. The authors always had these ties to the oil industry. They had these ties to the uh, nut industry. And the title of the article was The Reversal of Cardiovascular Disease with the Mediterranean Diet. All right, they had three groups. Now, to qualify for this study, you could not have had a diagnosis of cardiovascular disease, okay? Three groups, all right? So the first, the first group is, well, Mediterranean diet with nuts, Mediterranean diets with oil, second group, third group, low-fat diet, 39, 37% fat, which is actually quite high. And at the result, in the first group, they were, and actually in all three groups, there were scores of patients who had major cardiac events, cardiac, that's death, heart, stroke, heart attack, and death. And uh, now wait a minute. This was a group that came into this study without any cardiovascular disease, and now all three groups developed scores of these major cardiac events. So when the New York Times reporter nailed me and said, Dr. Esselstyn, this, this disagrees with you, what do you have to say about it? I said, well, look, it's very easy. They created disease in these people who didn't have it before. The title should be changed. It should be the creation of cardiovascular disease with the Mediterranean diet. Right. So, <laughs> now, <clears throat> When I was growing up as a kid, if I wanted nuts, you didn't just open a bag. There, we had them in the house, but they were always in shells. And there were these, these, these weren't specific nut pliers that we had with it. There was this thing that every time you use these pliers, you'd kind of pinch your finger. You had four or five nuts, that was enough. It was just, wasn't worth <laughs> work, working to get them. Nowadays, you go into any gas station and you can have every kind of nut on earth. And it's in a bag, you don't have to just open it and start, to start chewing them. Uh, now, I guess I just, as we're kind of running end, the end of our presentations, I have a, a word I want to say. I don't, uh, I don't underestimate for one minute the public. Now, it's gonna take a longer time for this message to get out. Why do I say I have this confidence in the public? Look at smoking cigarettes, 1964, the Surgeon General Report. Right. Boy, it took a while. But do you know that 20 million people have stopped smoking? 
I remember when I was first married, when Ann and I would have company to the house, we would put out ashtrays with cigarettes in our house. We never, we never smoked, but we thought it was discourteous if you didn't do that. What is, look at the change. Nobody would think about walking into your house lit up. It's not going to happen. The public has changed. And the other thing that happened was the public changed. I remember when seat belts first came out. People would say, my God, I'm never going to wear one of those. If I drive off into a canal, I'll drown. Well, there haven't been that many canal drownings. <laughs> and and lo, lo, lo and behold, you wouldn't think about sitting down in the passenger seat in the front seat without clipping in. So I, uh, I really uh, basically have a, a great uh, optimism that this message can get out as we keep, keep after it. And uh, especially with ambassadors like yourselves. You asked me to speak about, uh, I think, academic freedom. Is um, that the question? In any case, there's something similar to that. I, I, I find this, I'm, it, for me, this is a very uh, personal, very, I'm very passionate about this idea. In fact, I'm going to go out on a limb and say one of the greatest existential threats to the ability of academics to speak concerns the fact that we have been losing tenure opportunities at university. And the figure that I, the 9% figure I gave to you, Steve, that you read, uh, comes from a 2010 report from the American Association of University Professors who kind of laid down the, the rules for this, this game. That at that time, in 2010, 9% only of all the faculty in the country had achieved not only uh, academic tenure, but also had reached the highest level of full professorship. Only 9%, that was 2010. These days, as, as the years have rolled by, especially in the last 10 years or so, now we have people on, almost on hire, uh, adjunct professors, instructors, uh, hired for cheap labor, uh, under the control to, by the authorities to more or less teach the subject the way they want it to be told. Uh, this is a very serious problem that public tend not to be aware. Now, let me, let me just put a definition just so we can be on the same uh, wavelength here. Um, academic freedom is the opportunity to be able to speak what is on our minds without being punished for it or losing our jobs, if you will. That's protected by the concept of tenure, okay? So 9% of the people basically have tenure and the, the full boat as far as their, their level of activity is concerned. When we take away, when that is disappearing from our scene, this is the one place in a society that considers itself to be a democratic society, and I would argue this is the, almost a core definition of a democratic society, freedom of speech. The First Amendment that we have in this country is freedom of speech. One place to practice, practice that art and to illustrate it for the society at large, I would suggest, is in teaching institutions, whether in schools or higher, uh, higher institutions of learning, we have to maintain the opportunity for those who are being trained and have a responsibility to talk about serious matters. We have to maintain the opportunity for those people to have the freedom to say what they feel like saying without being controlled by the university authorities, for example, the one, the one I'm familiar with. Um, and I, I, as I say, I, it's just declined like that. And I'm really concerned now where that's headed. Because if we're going to lose the opportunity for uh, university people, academic people, to be able to maintain their, their freedom to say what they feel like, what they learned, if we're losing that, and we have lost a lot of it, we're in trouble. And I would suggest that a lot of the misinformation that comes forth is people within the research uh, community, in fact, sort of uh, doing research tethered to corporate money for one thing. Uh, incidentally, about two, I have figures on that, Walt. In uh, 2010, again, two-thirds of the, the funding now is from the corporate sector. I didn't know it was so high. It used to be much lower. But that's one figure that I've learned about, and I think it's more or less true. It's alarming. You know, and, and when in fact reality, it's much nicer to be, able to be funded by uh, you know, uh, public money, but whatever. 
I, I just think the academic institutions are in trouble these days, and the public tend not to know this. We're not able to tell. A lot of my colleagues are not able to actually st stand up, say what they have to say according to what they see, be right or wrong, but to say it and have the freedom to say it. And so we've got to be on guard. We're now just sort of drifting into this territory where people are teaching and doing research on hire with, with special <coughs> private money. I may be just too harsh, uh, Walter. I know you're Thank in a you. center place, but I think it's a serious problem. Well, the first thing I want to say to you good people as I look at the time is up sign flashing at us is that sitting through two and a half hour panel discussions is probably bad for your health. <laughs> so Steve, you need to shorten these things. Uh, so my question was about meat being a carcinogen. This was a 2015 report from IARC, the International Agency on Research on Cancer, a subsidiary of the WHO. If A causes B, one time in two, and we know it for sure, or if A causes B one time in 200, or 2,000, or 2 million, and we know it for sure, then in each instance, we know for sure that A is a cause of B, but the magnitude of risk is very different. That's clear, right? So what a IR concluded was that the quality of evidence linking processed meat to cancer was decisive. They did not say that the magnitude of risk was the same as tobacco, it's not. Processed meat is a bad actor, but it's not as bad as tobacco in terms of cancer risk. And in terms of meat in general, it was a class two carcinogen, which simply meant that the evidence was suggestive. Okay, so that's, that's what the IARC report said. Not that eating bacon once a year at Texas A&M will cause as much cancer as smoking daily, but rather a decisive link between processed meat consumption and rates of cancer. Magnitude of risk is smaller, but the quality of evidence was strong. And, and uh, it's my bedtime, <laughs> so I'll make this really fast. Uh, my question was about eggs, and I think yeah, certainly you can do a search on PubMed and you'll find research on both sides of the argument. But I just want to mention one study that I think is really interesting, and that was a study from Harvard that uh, looked at, oh, was it 280,000 people? Uh, something like that over about three decades. So we're looking at um, you know, it, it, just a, a, a large number of people. And what they found was taking 3% uh, of calories from animal protein and replacing that with plant protein resulted in a reduced risk of mortality. So this was specifically a mortality, um, lo looking at mortality in all of these individuals, and it was quite interesting. So three, just, just to put this into perspective, 3% of calories in a 2,000 sort of standard diet, 2,000 calorie diet is about 60 calories. So take 60 calories worth of meat and, and replace that or uh, replace that with uh, plants, and this is what you get, not 60, I'm sorry, 60 calories worth of animal protein and replace it with, with plant protein, and you get a uh, reduced risk of death. So if it was processed meat, it was a 34% risk reduction. If it was eggs, it was a 19% risk reduction. If it was unprocessed meat, it was a 12% risk reduction. If it was dairy, it was an 8% risk reduction. And if it was poultry or fish, it was a 6% risk reduction. So I, I think I'll just leave it at that. I'm very grateful to all of you for coming here, spending your time. We really appreciate it. We don't have this opportunity often. So on behalf of all of the people here on live stream on YouTube, from YouTube in the future, we are so grateful that you all were willing to come today. Thank you.